Hey, this is the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you are a returning subscriber, hey friend, hope you're having an amazing day. You look amazing. You see what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts? You get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So join us, hit that subscribe button, join us as we change the world by making our workplaces better. Uh, I got a real treat for you today. I'm here with uh, the one and only Ethics Sage. Uh, this is Steve Mintz. He is a uh, professor emeritus at Cal Poly uh, San Luis Obispo, and he has a really awesome uh, background, a really awesome perspective, and I'm super excited for you to join us today, Steve. Thank you so much for uh, for making it. How's it going? Sure. Thanks for having me. Everything's going well. So um, we were talking a little bit in the pre-show, and uh, you have a background in accounting, and so you and I are accounting brothers, and we didn't even know it. Talk, talk yeah. to us a little bit about how you got into accounting and how you've pivoted into now being a... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a real thought leader on ethics. Right. Well, my undergraduate degree was in accounting. Um, I sort of follow in my brother's footsteps. He was four years older. He went down the same road. So I emulated him a lot. And I went into public, account public accounting at the time. The firm I worked for was uh, Arthur Young, which uh, no longer is in existence. They merged with another firm became Ernst & Young. And I did that for about two, three years, during which time I earned my CPA. And I realized this wasn't something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. I really wanted to deal with young people, try to make a difference in their life. So I decided to go for a doctoral degree in accounting, which basically focused on ethics and cultural issues. And one thing led to another. Um, I eventually graduated with my PhD, started my career out here in California, researching, writing. Um, I have a textbook on accounting ethics. And to me, accounting is a great place to be with ethics because they have a very strict code mm. of ethics. That doesn't mean accountants follow it all the time, right. as we know from Enron and WorldCom. But nevertheless, it's a good foundation, or it was for me, to go from there to business ethics, to political ethics, and other areas. So what, what was it about accounting that attracted you to it? Initially, I think it was uh, pretty simplistic. Uh, by that, I mean, you know, debits equal credits. Right. Everything <laughs> balances. Right. So you kind of know, when you're doing homework, you kind of know if you're right or you're wrong. So that appealed to me, and I was always very good with math, so I wasn't afraid of the numbers side of accounting. Um, and there were a lot of really, really good jobs back then. The field was growing because of um, accountants becoming advisors, consultants to their clients, and a whole new area of operation. Right. Uh, and, and job availability opened up. So... You said something interesting. Um, accounting lends itself well to sort of launching into ethics because it has a really clean and defined code. How talk, talk to me a little bit about how that differs from these other areas that you mentioned, business ethics, political ethics, and so forth, where those clearly defined codes don't really exist, at least at, at least not to that same extent. Well, the thing about accounting is in order to practice as a CPA, uh, you have to be licensed by a state board of accountancy. There's no licensing in business ethics or political ethics. So you have to uh, pass an ethics exam to be licensed. So there's a stricter code of ethics because the consequences are greater. You violate a provision of the code, you could be suspended, you could lose your license. That doesn't happen in business ethics, political ethics, and so on. So I think it's just a stricter code the people who go into the field are more committed, or at least they should be. And that gives me something very concrete to teach students. So when I'm up there talking about ethics and the cynics will say, well, you know, why is this important to me? And so on, I say, well, you know, I assume you want to be a licensed CPA. So the state board licenses you and they can take it away if you violate behavioral rules. So what are some of those... Uh... You know, you're up there in front of the class. What are some of the things that you're really, um, you know, pushing on or underscoring with respect to 
accounting ethics and what are those things that seem to you know grade against the the students or are light bulb moments for the students well with respect to accounting ethics uh, especially those students who go into auditing independence is the backbone of the profession they have to be careful not to get involved personally with clients or client management which is sometimes not that easy to avoid right because a lot of business is done over lunch, uh, maybe at uh, country clubs. And it's only natural that a close relationship occurs. But that creates a conflict of interest, even if not in reality, in appearance. And, you know, appearances can kill you, as we know, certainly in politics. So, um, yeah, that, that to me was a very uh, relatively easy message to get across and point out why accountants were different than virtually any other field. If you look at, for example, lawyers, they owe their ultimate allegiance to the client, doctors, to the patient, accountants, to the public interest. So there's a difference there as to, you know, the stakes are higher for accountants and CPAs. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, that's a great point. That is a different sort of focus of the allegiance which should drive different behaviors. And it's obviously articulated in the, you know, what it takes to become, uh, it's, it's, it's articulated in the principles uh, behind, you know, becoming a CPA or becoming a public accountant or, uh, right. or, or whatever. But interestingly, um, you know, when I have, you know, so I got my CPA as well. I kind of followed a similar track to you. Um, and as I've gotten into other fields, so many of the uh, the principles, you know, from a behavioral side or from an ethical side that are sort of pounded into your head in public accounting about independence, about conflicts of interest, about those kinds of things. Um, I've seen, you know, they're good rules because everyone's trying to like emulate them every, everywhere else, but like there's just no teeth anywhere else. I mean, to your point, you can lose your CPA, uh, you can lose your license, whatever. Um, if you violate those things, to your point, the stakes are higher. Um, and I don't really know the answer to, you know, creating uh, equally high stakes that should and should hopefully drive those right behaviors in these other realms. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, with respect to business, uh, this says this is up to the organization to have a strong code of ethics. Yeah. And not only have it on a piece of paper, but to live it. You know, we talk about in ethics, walking the talk of ethics. So a lot of companies, they have this code, it's nice, it's glossy, they file it away, never to be looked at again. You really need to train your employees in the code. What are the things you can do, you can't do? Who do you go to if there's pressure in the workplace? One of the key issues in business is whistleblowing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of companies, uh, they say on paper, they'll support the whistleblower, but when push comes to shove, Maybe not so much. Right. Maybe there's retaliation and so on. So uh, we talk about uh, the culture of an organization that it has to have an ethical tone at the top. So if the top leaders are not ethical, if they're not acting the way they say you should act on paper, you get a cynical environment. And that's where things tend to break down. So it has to be incorporated internally. There should be consequences with respect to your employment. But, you know, unless you commit fraud or something like that, you're not going to jail for something uh, that happens within the business realm. Right. But I guess I'm a little bit wrong about what I said. You know, the, the stakes are higher. To your point, the, it's up to the company to create those stakes. And I mean, if you're going to put your money where your mouth is in terms of supporting whistleblowers by actually doing it, actually supporting those people, actually promoting them, holding them up as the guardians of the culture that, you know, they actually are, or you're going to let people go regardless of level or regardless of how far beyond quota they're bringing their sales in due to some kind of an ethical violation that you espouse to be important or that you say is, you know, critical. Um, you, you can create that sort of those teeth within your own business or within your, your own team. It's about, um, yeah, it's about like creating, creating the circumstances of what, um, creating the circumstances for success in the context of whatever those, those guideposts are for the ethical environment that you're trying to create, you know? Yeah, a long time ago, Milton Friedman said the only responsibility of businesses was to earn a profit. Right. And I know when we talked about that, I think I was in graduate school at the time, 
And we said, well, what does this mean? Does this mean uh, nothing else matters? It doesn't matter how you get to the profit. It's sort of the ends justify the means. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was a very, uh, that was like a mantra of business for a long time. I think Friedman did ultimately modify that by he saying walked something it back like, a little, yeah. 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 Maximize profit within the rules of the game, so to speak. But he never went so far as to say businesses had a social responsibility or what we talk about today with things like conscious capitalism, uh, sustainability, ESG, and, and all those things where social responsibility in some form or another has been brought into the evaluation process. So that's interesting. I've never talked to somebody who was in graduate school uh, when that famous article came out. And that, to your point, cast a, uh, I don't want to, yeah, maybe a shadow, it cast a shadow over business for a really long time. It That mentality crept its way into MBA schools. It was sort of made its way into uh, you know, economics, it made its way into textbooks, it made its way obviously into the minds of those people uh, who became titans of industry who were controlling large organizations that then everybody else was trying to replicate. Like, it was a very insidious mentality that regardless of what uh, Milton Friedman actually meant, regardless of whether, you know, his, you know, his what I called walking it back or his sort of clearing up of the message, regardless of what the core of that was, the message that was sent was one of exactly what you said. The ends justify the means or the ends justify the meanness, frankly, uh, in the context of business. What was that like when that came out? Was it a lot of like head scratching? Like, tell me a little bit about how you saw things pivot uh, after that, if in fact that was a major catalyst or a major sort of turning point for the direction of business uh, in general. Yeah, I remember in graduate school, we had many debates with the professor over this issue. Interesting. And a lot of us were idealistic, as many young people are, and it just didn't sound right. Um, I think it was about the same time that there was a leak of toxic chemicals at Union Carbide in a plant in India where hundreds of people got burned or died. And, you know, uh, maybe they maximized profit because the chemicals were not stored properly. It was less of a cost. Now, how could you say that you're you're ignoring or putting in second place right. social responsibility? So there were a lot of debates. And I'd have to say the class was probably split uh, two against Milton Friedman, one, you know, uh, for Milton Friedman. So two thirds of us pretty much were uh, arguing with the professor over this issue who, who supported Milton Friedman. He basically said, well, where do you draw the line with social responsibility? Right. What's socially responsible and what's not? Is right. it socially responsible to pay a living wage? And we were starting to talk about gender equity. What does it include? The problem was that field was just forming right. at that point. It was at that point that courses in business, government, and society were making their way into MBA programs. So it wasn't very clearly defined, although certain things were pretty obvious with respect to how you treat your workers, discrimination, health and safety in the workplace, which were the early earliest issues pretty much of uh, social responsibility. Uh, so interesting. Um, I wonder, you know, 10, 15 years after that debate, how that split in the class would, would look. Would it be two versus one on the other side? Um, it's just very, it's, it's very interesting. Um, and you know, all those issues that you just talked about, it's not like we've solved them. You know what I'm no. saying? Like they're still the same issues today, you know? Well, that's, that's life in America, isn't it? And yeah, many, true. <laughs> we're talking about things we've been talking about for who knows, 20, 30 years, kick the can down the road, call it what you may. Yeah. They're just very hard decisions which is why they don't be made. They're not made right away. And they're just delayed, delayed, delayed. I think corporations have become much more socially conscious. Um, I think they realize that they had, they wield so much power and influence because of their, their massive sizes, the number of people they employ, their global reach. Because at the same time, we were talking about social responsibility. We were talking about the advent of the multinational enterprise okay. and the responsibilities they have, not only in the U.S., but overseas. So it, it's it's been an evolution, have a long way to go. My fear has always been 
whether companies are treating this issue as uh, a lot of them have fancy statements now, especially for things like sustainability and ESG. Right. Is, is it window dressing? Well, that's or do the question. they really feel it to the core? Well, that's the question. And I think, um, yeah, where is the line between the greenwashing? You know, it's kind of greenwashing what uh, a lot of folks are doing and what I think a lot of those who are against this broader ESG movement, you know, maybe rightly so, uh, in terms of what they're seeing would point to, you know, that it's a bunch of fluff and that it's just, uh, it's just marketing and that there's not a real heart behind it. And to your point, you sometimes see these elaborate, you know, ESG statements where they're working on 20 or 25 different initiatives. And it's like, well, you're not actually doing that. And how can you, how can you be effective across those things? Um, there's a, there's a friend, uh, named Allison Taylor, who's, uh, really a massive thought leader. And, you know, she has a lot of great, um, pieces on ESG and what she would say is you got to focus on three or four things that actually matter that you're actually going to do some something with, not just in terms of like credibility, but in terms of you actually having the impact that you could potentially have as a larger organization. Because to your point, large companies have the opportunity because they're so big and they have so much capital and they're so influential, whatever, they have this opportunity to potentially, you know, make this massive impact. But many of them seem to fall flat. And I don't think that most corporations are full of, you know, a bunch of, uh, I don't know. I think there's a bunch of people that are generally trying to make the world better and um, they kind of get caught up in the machine and then it ends up probably appearing from the outside as uh, inauthenticity. Like, I don't think people build those ESG statements with a drive to sort of per se be really inauthentic and put up a bunch of like BS. But I think it ends up being that way because it's, you know, it's like a hydra of like, <laughs> multi-headed yeah. trying to go all these different areas and you don't make any progress or something. Yeah. Well, the, the key issue we're both, we both have an accounting background is measurement. Totally. I mean, how do you measure things that affect the environment or society or governance? Governance may be a little bit easier because you can get into the financial statements and so on, but you know, carbon emissions, we're still struggling right. with that climate change. It's the measurement thing. If you can't measure it, can you really rely on it right. no matter what a company says in their ESG statement? So uh, that's being dealt with. There is a standard setting board in the United States, the Sustainability Accounting Standard Setting Board, we call it SASB, and they're dealing with setting guidelines, not enforceable standards yet, right. but guidelines. And internationally, there are guidelines. The uh, Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, is an international effort to set some standards. But it's going to take a while. It's complicated. Not everybody agrees on what should be measured. But there's been some progress, I have to say. Lots of conferences. I've gone to a few where academics discuss what should be measured, how should it be measured, how could it be a reliable measurement, transparent, and so on. Right. So I think the direction is good. Okay. So that's, that's hopeful. Uh, that's, that's encouraging. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to that conversation that you guys were debating with your professor and he's saying, where do you draw the line? And I think that's the argument for the other side of it is, well, you know, you can't compare things uh, across these different jurisdictions <clears throat> because everything is like denominated in something different at least with dollars, it's all denominated in dollars, right? Or you can at least trans, you know, translate the dollars into a single currency, so to speak, to have that comparability. And, you know, even with your example about, you know, measuring governance, you're measuring that through financial statements, essentially, uh, if you're going to have any kind of comparability, which in and of itself is, again, sort of denominated in dollars. The fact that we don't have, you know, a sort of a common cur currency across these different areas that ESG touches, to your point makes it difficult to come up with actual standards and at best is a guidelines, you know, it's going to be a, a reliance on guidelines, which then again ha has so much subjectivity into it, which le le allows for uh, at least the perverse incentive at least is present uh, to a greater degree for it yeah. to be gamed or manipulated, you know, which again leads to why people I think don't trust it. And, you know, it, you know, it's having so many headwinds uh, in these different areas, you know? Yeah, there's there's uh, there's a lot of uh, pushing going on from the SEC, um, other regulators to do something because you know there are a lot of uh, investments now in ESG funds, mm -hmm. 
And if people are going to put their money in these funds, they want to know, no matter how you measure it, they want to know whether the goals are met, what the problems right. are, how they're dealt with. Why should I put $1,000, $10,000 into this fund? Right. So that's kind of one of the areas that's being worked on now. Yeah, that 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 whole thing is a pretty interesting uh, side of the ESG um, discussion. Um, but I mean, any way you want to cut it, you know, how we get there, uh, how we measure it is go going to be debated. You know, as, as as you say, there's good movement. We're moving in, a you know, the right direction. But I'm saying irrespective of how it's actually de denominated and compared, the market cares about it. My generation, the Gen Z generation, absolutely care about it, and they have wildly different views on what a business is and what it should be doing. Most all that you would ask would say that that some kind of a social impact or some kind of a commitment to the greater good uh, or the public interest, you know, to use that term, is, uh, you know, part of a business's sort of purpose, uh, which is definitely in conflict with the sort of, you know, the, the caricature of the, you know, Jack Welsh type dollars over everything kind of approach to to business. How do you see that playing out over the next, you know, decade? Well, uh, you, you made a very good point about uh, your generation, uh, millennials, Gen Zers. Every survey I've seen, it says that folks of those generations want to work for a socially responsible company. They're willing to even take less money if they believe in a cause. So we have, of course, social entrepreneurship now which is a big deal. So that's that's very encouraging to me, teaching college students and, and hearing them really being committed to that, uh, getting away from the, the usual framework mm -hmm. of why you go to work for a firm, what you expect. All these things are changing. It's in flux. I don't know where it's going to end up. But uh, we, not only the social issues we talk about, Work-life balance, for example, uh, people who are working for firms, they don't just want to work 60 hours a week or 70 right. hours a week, um, which in some professions, certainly in accounting, certain times a year like now is not unusual. Right. Uh, but you said you, you used an interesting word when you were talking about uh, these folks and you, the word you used was committed. And I think you know, you can show your commitment through your actions. And if someone is going to B school, for example, and they're willing to take a less, a lower salary, uh, to work for a company that whose, you know, purpose they believe in, as you say, um, that's a proof of that commitment. So maybe it just works itself out because sort of organically coming up from the, you know, the, the individual level, you know, there's so much influence that as those people, you know, ascend to sort of positions in power and their, their organization. It's just naturally going to prioritize in this like new hierarchy of values. I don't know. Exactly. No, I agree with you completely on that. So what message would you have for the young, the younger generation about making, you know, ethical decisions, both in their lives and in, you know, in general, maybe in business? Yeah. You know, I, uh, I like to use expressions, phrases, students tend to remember it better and then teach off of that. So one I use is ethics is easier said than done. This makes the point to them, this is not a black and white issue, ethics. It's not always 100% right, 100% wrong. There are shades of gray. So you have to be able to think through. This is where the analytical reasoning skills, critical thinking skills come into play to balance all the different interests, the stakeholders, what their needs are, to look at things like utilitarianism, cost-benefit right. analysis, uh, Kantianism, uh, rights, and so on. So this is why we even have ethics courses to hopefully teach them how to think in an ethical way. So when they face dilemmas in the workplace, such as being pressured by their boss to overlook this, overlook that, go along with financial wrongdoing, they know they have a framework to deal with. And there are steps in the decision-making model that we go over. And then the other phrase I use a lot is just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. So students seem to catch on to that thing. They say, okay, I have a right to do something, but it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. And they'll say, well, if I have a right to do something, how could it not be the right thing to do? 
And I try to make the point that your actions affect others. It's not just you. You have to look at the consequences of your actions. So for example, uh, I could get on the internet this afternoon and uh, pick somebody who I don't like and bully them. Right. I have a right to do that. Nobody's going to put me in jail for that. But is it the right thing to do? Clearly not. Right. We've seen a lot of examples with bullying and uh, young people, especially so affected by it, you know, even becoming uh, suicidal right. as a result. Um, so what is Kantianism? What is that? Kantian? Yeah. It's basically uh, a rights theory that you judge ethical actions by what rights a person has. You could say constitutional rights, but uh, there's a philosophy or part of that philosophy called uh, consequential, uh, not consequentialism, but deontology, which says, ask yourself if somebody else was in the same position I'm in now, had basically the same decision to make, what decision would I want them to make? Mm. What do I think would be their best decision? If I make that same decision, you know, it's sort of universal. And the concept is universality. So I'm looking to capture something that others would do in a similar situation for similar reasons. In order to like remove my own bias or my own sort of potential moral hazard to self-deal or something like that? Correct. That's correct. Interesting. Exactly. Um, so you also alluded to, you know, getting, you know, I want to hear about, you know, what you see the role for ethical leaders are in business, but I want to hear a little bit about this like decision-making framework and which of these different sort of schools of thought, just in your opinion, are most, you know, valuable for us to like, you know, use uh, as lenses, you know, to see the world through as we kind of wrestle through the gray that is business, that is life. Right. Right. Well, mentioned briefly, uh, Kantian rights, uh, very briefly, cost-benefit analysis, which is widely used in business in a variety of uh, situations. That's where you balance the harms and the benefits, and you make a decision that maximizes the net benefits to as many stakeholders as possible, because you can't always satisfy everybody all of the time, right. so there are trade-offs. And that's very appealing to students. But it does sometimes lead to the ends justify the means. So you have to be careful. Well, yeah. And you, you also have to be careful that you're not a, like a naturalist in your own. I mean, that's only as good as the assumptions you're making about those costs and those benefits, which by their nature have to be denominated again in dollars. So you have to be able to price those things out. And, um, you know. Great point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when I was in private equity, uh, there would be sometimes debates we, we would get into. And, you know, there's no there's no way to quantify like a culture of a company. And, and yet we both know that a company with a strong culture is probably going to outperform or put it the other way, a company with a terrible culture that leads to really low employee engagement. Uh, that's going to show up in a lot of different areas. It's going to show up in the profitability. It's going to show up in the turnover. It's going to show, show up in the churn of customers to show up all over the place. Um, but that is very hard to quantify within, you know, a high confidence interval, which leads us to say, well, just, we'll just leave that out of the model. So just by its nature, because there's so much, there's so many, you know, amorphous things, uh, things that are sort of outside the realm of like just straight naturalism, which can wind up in an Excel sheet. Those, those models are both usually incomplete, but also to your point, highly appealing because it's like at least a framework that you can start plugging some stuff into and you can kind of at least feel good. Like, well, I took sort of a logical, rational approach to making this decision, you know? Right, right. Well, the method that I like the most of ethical reasoning is uh, virtue ethics. It's really probably the field that I've made my name for myself, so to speak, academically and writing a lot of articles because virtue ethics deals with the character traits of the individual and says that ethical decisions should be made by people who are honest, who have integrity, they're responsible, so on and so forth. Because if you use utilitarianism or rights theory or whatever, and you come to a conclusion that this is the best decision, that doesn't mean the person who came to that decision will actually make that decision, will actually carry it out. 
because that's another matter. But if you're an ethical person with high character, you have a lot of integrity, your principle base, the logic dictates that you're more likely to do it because it's ingrained in your character. Interesting. So that's one of the reasons I like virtue ethics. Yeah, because these frameworks are only as good as the actions that are taken as a result of the decisions made through them, right? That's exactly so right. So you can come up with this great thing, but then uh, if you're not actually going to do it, then what's what's the point? I'd love to dive deeper into this virtue ethics because this sounds extremely interesting. What are some of the things, you know, you said that you've made your name uh, in this realm. Maybe give us a crash course on what it means. I, I know you just gave us a brief kind of kind of overview of uh, how that that can manifest itself. But how, talk to us about your path into vir virtue ethics and what it is about it that resonates so deeply with you to where you just wanted to spend, you know, more time building your name upon this, you know, this pillar. Sure. Well, first to uh, start at the beginning, so to speak, uh, I had parents who were very ethical. They were always talking about right and wrong. Whenever we discussed something, whenever I messed up as a youngster, they wouldn't just, you know, send me in my room without dinner. They would explain why. They try to make sure I knew why. So honesty was ingrained in me from a very young age, as was personal responsibility, because if I did mess up, you know, it wasn't just go to bed, no dinner tonight. You know, you might be grounded for a week or whatever it is, take away. Back then, it would have been your your favorite toy rather than your your iPad, <laughs> the internet. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so I, you have to start with that background. Some way you have to pick it up. Is it parents? Is it religious institution? Is it the educational institutions, which I think are failing youngsters by not talking enough about that today? So it starts with having that foundation, and then one of the it, situations I was involved in. I mentioned that I worked for Arthur Young, predecessor to Ernst & Young, yeah. and I was an intern there, very young, very green. And there was a situation where my best friend, who was also an intern, he had done something wrong. It was a calculation and a schedule that we were turning over to our superior. And um, he had already handed the schedule in after he realized, he re realized afterwards that he made a mistake in it. Yeah. So he approached me and he said, look, Steve, I need you to cover for me. I'm not going to point out the mistake. If the mistake is caught by the superior, we'll deal with it then. But if any questions are asked of you, Steve, you need to back me up. Well, I made the mistake of backing him up. I mean, here I was, you know, what was I, an 18, 19 year old kid? Really, my moral compass wasn't completely formed. The superior found out. He asked me about it. I had to cover up my mistake. So I learned early on the consequences of um, not being truthful. In other words, loyalty is an ethical value, but it only goes so far. Mm -hmm. You can't have loyalty trump honesty and integrity. You get into trouble that way. So fortunately, the consequences weren't that severe for me. They were more so for my friend who did make the mistake. But I learned a lesson that I have to look at really what's the most important thing, not the most important person in making a decision. And in accounting, we're told if you have a crisis situation, you don't understand anything, go to your supervisor always. And I learned that lesson very early on. So um, character was formed in me at a very young age. And when I started doing my ethical research, this was after my PhD, very few people were talking about virtue ethics. If you looked at philosophy books, it was Kantian rights. It was um, John Rawls, um, utilitarianism, and maybe a few other things, uh, the common good, and so on. You wouldn't find virtue talked about. And somebody from a publisher approached me and said, uh, this is a method that we think should be developed are you interested in getting involved? And I said, well, let me study it a little bit more, which I did. And simultaneously, the California Society of CPAs approached me because I had already developed a reputation for research and ethics and asked me to write up case studies on ethical dilemmas that CPAs had faced and they would publish it. 
I agreed, good sabbatical uh, activity for me, went to a dozen different firms. Some, some of the professionals shared their stories with me. I wrote up case studies, changed all the names. Yeah. Nobody knew the company. Nobody knew the people. Made sure that my interviewee approved of what I was going to let out. And the common thread was character. Those people I interviewed who did do the right thing, and more often than not, that was the case, because as you might imagine, not too many professionals are going to be interviewed <laughs> right. if they blew it. You <laughs> right. know. They all uh, fell back on honesty, integrity, trustworthiness. So I started to uh, read about virtue more, write articles. Uh, the, the accounting ethics textbook that I have out uh, was built on a virtue background, a whole chapter on it pretty much. It just spoke to me because of my own character-based upbringing. So think about this, or I'm thinking about this. When does that character turn on? Is it your parents laying that foundation, or was it you getting that light bulb moment uh, after you were loyal to your friend over the honesty, which you say sort of trumps that loyalty is this just a stupid question to ask? Is it just an amalgamation of a lot of things? And I'm asking it in the context of, can we teach it beyond a certain point? I kind of don't think I can teach. If I'm hiring a guy who's 45, I'm probably not going to teach him like work ethic. You know what I'm saying? Like he probably has a work ethic or he doesn't have a, have a, a work ethic. Do you believe that character can sort of be taught or turned on uh, or activated uh, later? Or is it really just all kind of determined by that was sort of first seven, whatever, 12 formative, four, formative years of, you know, highly ethical parents instilling those values in the individual? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I get it all the time I get from students, you can't teach ethics. Well, that's, of course, obviously debatable. But I tell them, look, I can teach ethics. What do you think I'm doing standing yeah, in front of you? I'm doing it, right. I'm lecturing, I'm showing <laughs> videos, we're doing role-playing exercises. So the bottom line is, I could teach ethics. Whether you learn the lesson, that's another matter. But I say to them, I could teach financial reporting. Whether you learn the lesson, right. that's another matter. You have to be receptive. You have to have your own character to, uh, to grab on to the ethical behavior. So, you know, I always feel like I need to try to teach ethics. There's so much wrong in society today. There's so many things that we're dealing with problematic. And business, of course, is at the forefront. Uh, we went through the, the Great Recession of 2008, 2009. Even before that, there were a lot of instances of fraud going back to the Enrons and the world comes. Right. And you have... I just feel as an educator, I have to try to do it. It may not work. Um, I always feel like there's three different types of students. One, I'm preaching to the choir. I really don't have to teach them anything. Two, I'm never going to change them. Their mind is made up and they don't think ethics is important. Maybe they're very self-centered and all their actions are based on self-interest, which is not ethical, at least not completely. And then there's the middle. And that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. I'm looking at making the middle ground that might be thinking about it, but they're just not there yet. Maybe they don't have the tools to make ethical decisions influence their behavior. Yeah, so I think it can be done. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's the battleground for sure, that middle of the bell curve. Um, right. And, you know, you know, maybe we're all just kind of on this path and our character is building uh, over time and it's sort of defeatist to think like, well, if you're not a high character person at a certain age, then you're just not going to be that. Um, yeah. Uh, but it, it is an interesting question because if then the major driver of like our world becoming more ethical is that people of high virtue are making the most important decisions that are going to affect more people, uh, and if then a business is sort of a collection of individuals that has the potential to make a big impact in our world, it then is incumbent on leaders in that business to make sure that they're kind of hiring for high character if they're going to perpetuate the culture of ethics that can lead to that sort of, you know, that better outcome that, you know, maybe people are striving for and, and so forth. How Do you agree with that? And if so, how do we start to 
I don't, I just don't see people um, really trying to hire for a uh, character. I mean, maybe they do. It's just, I mean, it's not like, uh, it's not a major thing that guys are, are, are hiring for. I mean, there's a couple of questions usually about, uh, tell me how your character has been, um, you know, threatened or something over time and whatever. But like, I just don't see it as highly prioritized as like, I don't know, like de your degree or your past success or something like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not it's not as measurable. Yeah, it's not as objective. Yeah. How are you going to interview somebody, engage their character? Well, you can certainly uh, this is where social media comes into play. If you yeah. examine their social media imprint, that could, you know, really make an effect in terms of the character um, decision and hiring somebody. Yeah. But, you know, it's Warren Buffett, who was sort of the leader in saying that there are three P's in successful business, principle, purpose, and people. Right. And that is apparently his mantra. And he says, no matter how intelligent the future hiree, if they don't have integrity, their technical skills, their um, knowledge, it's not going to make a difference because they're going to give in to pressure when push comes to shove. Right. So if you were hiring, how would you try to assess it? I mean, I know it's hard to do in, in 45 minutes or something, but how do you how do you do it? Well, I would come up with some ethical dilemma. Leave a dollar on that, the floor, see if they report it. Yeah, you could do a simple <laughs> one like that or one more. Yeah, yeah one of the ones I, I, I used to use was uh, you're, you're in a line at a bagel shop and uh, in front of you are all these cream cheeses and so on. You can take out and pay when you get up front to pick up your bagels and you're moving up the line and you see a $20 bill. It's not your $20 bill, but you saw the person in front of you drop it as uh, he or she went to their pocket to pay for their order. What do you do? Do you pocket it? Do you give it back to them? What is your action? You know, something like that. Yeah. Now, you may not necessarily get the true answer from the uh, candidate, but you may, because some will say, well, you know, the, per the person dropped it. They don't know. Why shouldn't I keep it? Right. Why not me? If not me, somebody else. Um, so let's change gears a little bit. I want to talk about the role of like empathetic and compassionate leadership in business. Do you think there there's a role for it? And if so, uh, people who believe that that's a role, how do you tell them to balance those things against the sort of objective performance that every business needs to generate, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think empathy and compassion in business is, is essential, more essential today than ever before. Maybe this is a function to some extent of COVID, but, and this, this fits in with the work-life balance. Yeah. Uh, employees want to know that their employers care about them, care about their life, care about their life circumstances. Um employers should be sensitive to the burnout factor. Yeah. If you're starting to impose 60, 70, 80 hour a week responsibilities on employees, you know, sooner or later, push is going to come to shove and they're going to probably look for another job. You know, you, if they need time off for a personal matter, you have to be compassionate. Put yourself in their situation. Maybe they have a sick child who has to be home from school for a week or whatever. If it was your sick child, wouldn't you want to be able to stay home with them? Not everybody could afford childcare to do that. So sensitivity to the needs of the employees, um, their health and welfare, their desires from a job, what are they looking for? This is very critical today. I think young people I'm more concerned about this. Years ago, you know, my generation, okay, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Maybe I don't think it's right, but I'll do it because that's the way things were back then. You didn't question as much as you did today. So I think there are compassionate leaders. I think Warren Buffett is one example of that, who really care about the people that they hire um, and try to provide the best work experience um balanced between personal and work i'm not saying it's 50 50 no probably it's something like 60 40 maybe work to personal life something like that 
or even maybe more, especially when you're young and you're trying to make your bones, so to speak. Maybe it's 75, 25. It also depends on what your personal life is like. Do you right. have kids, for example? Right. So the whole workplace is just changing in all these ways we've been talking about work-life balance, uh, social responsibility, conscious capitalism, sustainability, on and on and on. There's more pressure. And I think you mentioned it earlier, as these youngsters, Gen Z, millennials become in positions of power, I think we're going to start to see some real progress. You said something earlier that um, before people weren't as apt to question things. And now it seems like everyone's more, I don't know, interested in questioning things. What do you think that's, root, that's rooted in? What does that come from? Well, that's, that's a tough one. It's probably an evolution. I doubt that it happened all of a sudden. We went from not questioning to questioning. It was the culture that I grew up in. You know, you didn't question your parents. If they said do something or don't do something or, or put out some punishment, boy, that would be pretty nice. much at least the way that would be I nice if it. that was still around. Well, yes and no. I think we've gone. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have uh, I have little ones, and they. <laughs> I think uh, we've gone. I think we, I think that that boat has sailed. Yeah, that's but, gone. That's gone. Sailed, yeah. No, we have iPads now, at least. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's just a cultural shift. We were taught to question things. I don't know if it goes back to the '60s maybe with the Vietnam War, where obviously a whole generation was questioning right. um, uh, an incredible event in our, in our life cycle that was still feeling ramifications from. Mm -hmm. And uh, the gender equality movement, racial equality movement, things were being questioned society, from a societal point of view all the time. All positive stuff, I think. Uh, now, you know, it's... I don't know if we've gone too far, but we're talking about things like woke, woke, wokeism in the workplace and what that entails. And are we questioning the social policies of a company, cancel culture? All these things have worked its way into the lexicon of business. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see where it goes. Because uh, we have an election in less than two years, and probably these issues of woke, cancel culture, uh, groupthink, all of these uh, terms are going to be debated, I believe, both with respect to education of young people, the political system, and even in the workplace, I believe. Um, I think you're right. It's going to be an interesting... Uh... It's going to be an interesting election cycle for sure. Um, so we're getting close to the end here. I always like to ask this question. If you could go back in time and uh, give a young Steve some advice that you wish you had earlier, what would that advice be? Yeah, I think about that a lot. And um, uh, this may come as a surprise to some of the listeners, but I was not that good of a student. Uh, until I got into college. All of a sudden, the light bulb went, up, went off. I was a mediocre student. I didn't work all that hard. I managed to get through. Uh, I think I would have, if I could think back, tell myself to get started a little bit sooner. I may have missed out on things in my earlier education that I regret now. Yeah. Um, in addition to which, the work ethic. I had to develop a work ethic over time. I didn't have it initially, but a work ethic is something you build on. Yeah, It just doesn't happen overnight. And to me, that's one of the things that we're missing as a society, a strong work ethic, efficiency in what we do. And then finally, um, I would say to myself, do something you love and love what you do, which really did not occur to me after I had worked in public accounting for several years and then finally got into uh, teaching at the university level. But, you know, it turned out fine for me, obviously. But for a youngster, a younger Steve, to say to somebody going into high school or in high school, find your passion, 
do something you love and do it as well as you can would be my message. That's a great message. Uh, you know, you said something interesting about, um, you know, this work ethic in society being lacking. What do you think has caused that? Well, to some extent, there's a no consequences society out there. The consequences are not not the same, uh, even uh, somewhat regrettably in our criminal justice system. Yeah. People are in the system, out of the system before you can turn your head around. That's just one example. In schools, years ago when I was in school, you got the grade you, were, you, you, you really earned. And um, I mean, I'm for I'm all for equity in, in everything in life. Yeah. But to say that everybody should get the same grade or somehow the grade should be normalized based on a lower level concerns me a little bit. Uh, we've gotten away from meritocracy and pursuit of excellence, which by the way is, is, an, is a philosophical element of virtue, the pursuit of excellence, because you want to have an excellent character. It's an yeah. interesting connection there actually. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Well, I mean, if that's that true, think... right? If that's true, then that would sort of, mean that there's probably a correlation with like uh dropping virtue you know a falling virtue level across society if those two things sort of move together yes yeah i think personal responsibility consequences for your actions accountability we've gone too far away from having that as a society because some people don't want to be told they did something wrong right or they didn't do something well enough and but, again that uh, that trickles into organizations and organizations, you know, you were talking about people in general, but I think as I was listening to that, that, that applies to companies in general. That's know? correct. Yeah. Right. Well, they don't call them the ethics sage for nothing. This was a great uh, conversation, Steve. Thanks so much for, uh, for joining us. Uh, sure. Where can we find some of your, your work? Where can we find you uh, in the world? Uh, well, my website is uh, all one word, Stephen Mintz Ethics, S-T-E-V-E-N-M-I-N-T-Z Ethics.com. Very good. So by going to my website or just Googling the Ethics Sage, a lot of stuff will come up. Very good. I write uh, three blogs, one on uh, just general ethics, societal, one on workplace, one on higher education. Cool. And uh, like I say, just... Uh, Googling ethics sage, a lot of stuff will come on that your reader might be interested in. Cool. Well, I could talk to you all day. This has been uh, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate you being so generous with us. And uh, until next time.